Welcome to the Hero Maker Podcast. I'm Andrea Shreeman, writer, director, EP, living in LA. I'm Jennifer Morrison, and I currently serve as the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Vermont. We are here to seek out and tell the full story of our friends who were murdered in college, Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton III. We really need to make sure that their deaths were not in vain and that every possible lesson and improvement for the system can be squeezed from the retelling of the circumstances that ultimately led to the identification of their killer. I'm blown away and honored to be able to share with you that today, a very brave, courageous young woman who was a survivor from one of Alfredo Prieto's attacks is with us. She is a woman who testified twice, not once, but twice, once around the time of her own event. And she was able to help get our friend's perpetrator on death row in California. And then again, testified in our friend's case, which was in 2007 and 2008 to end up getting the perpetrator on death row in a second state, in the state of Virginia, where our friends were murdered. There's only about 20 criminals who've been on death row in multiple states. This is a real unique aspect of this criminal. Lisa has joined us today. Thank you for trusting us, Lisa. Yeah, she's brave. And the fact that you forged a bond with her and made her comfortable enough to come talk to us and willing to be on our show is amazing. It's a testament to your humanity. But for our listeners, we need to give a bit of a trigger warning. There's some pretty hard stuff that gets talked about in this episode. This one's not to be taken lightly and probably not for youngins. But uh, grab a grab a tissue and block everything else out and give this a listen because this is really deep stuff. Here we go. This is our star witness, as we're calling her, Lisa. And a true hero, like capital H, capital E, capital R, capital O. Yeah. So, Jen, just to let you know, I just started speaking with Lisa about 15 minutes ago. You have been extremely generous, Lisa, with your experience. and Yeah, I just... You just go through it with me and you ask me what you want me to explain. I could go from beginning to end, but it would take me a a long time. And I do get very emotional. All I have to say is he is where he's at today. And that is off of this face of this earth is because of Rachel's mother. She touched my heart so much. Veronica, um, through Christmas, she sent me a big, huge Christmas card. And she would call me and she would talk to me. And I knew I had to do it for her. I did it for us here in California, but I did it for her. When I spoke to her, it just broke my heart that she had to go through that, you know? Yeah. It breaks my heart that you had to go through this. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to the last podcast where you weren't aware of none of this, huh, in California? No. no. Yeah. No. And it's been intentional. I mean, since we decided, you know, to, to move ahead on something to honor Rachel and Warren. And yeah. so I'm in the dark intentionally and it's, It's interesting, given my career in that I'm not used to being the one without the answers. (laughs) You know, I could recall seeing the Unsolved Mystery episode where I believe it may have been, I think it was on Rachel's, like how they found the body and how they described him as being a black man, an African-American man, you know? I believe I seen that. For some reason, I want to keep telling myself I seen that in the back of my mind. I was 17 years old. I was just barely starting to begin my life and then this destroyed it. It destroyed it. It sent me back. Like for a long time, I don't trust. It's hard for me to trust people. I won't trust people, period, at all anymore. But my main concern is to protect my four girls and my grandchildren. I'll I'll never let nothing bad like this happen to them. Never. If I can prevent it from happening, I will because I'm just so afraid for them. My mom never stayed the same. She goes to work every day, but she comes home. She's been at her job for 38 years. She works at a hospital and she comes home and she doesn't come out of the house. She's always in the house. My mom's always in the house. Well, the world can be a scary place when you've seen the dark side of it. A lot of people go through life blissfully unaware of how horrible and depraved some people can be. Mm -hmm. 
I never imagined anything like that happening. I would see it on the news and watch Unsolved Mysteries and so forth. But the day it happened, I was so afraid. All I could do was what they said, keep my eyes closed, my head between my legs. And I did that. But as I did that, I was counting stop signs, counting stop signs, counting every stop they made because they were in the city that I grew up in. So I knew where I was headed. And once we hit the highway, I didn't know where we were headed, which direction we were going in. All I could hear was cars. The, I could feel the wind, but I couldn't see anything. I was determined to get out of there alive. I wasn't going to die that night. I wasn't ready to die. And I was hoping we all made it out of life, but it didn't work out like that. I'm going to be honest. I don't know the circumstances of how you got in the car. I know a little bit about what happened in the remote location that you wound up in. Have you actually gone to the court records here in California to read it? No. No. Andrea won't let me. No, that's not true. I <laughs> just say it's me in the dark. <laughs> I haven't even pursued the court records, actually, but I can. Yeah. Yeah, they're there. They're available. Okay. It tells you everything. You know, actually, it came out in the newspaper and from the trial all the reports were there and the DA that actually prosecuted him was really good. He was really cocky then. He used to sit there and he used to laugh and he used to look at us and he looked at me and I was intimidated. I was so afraid of him, so afraid of him. I can remember at the time, the detective, his name was Eric Copley. He was an Ontario police officer. He would pick me up from the house in the morning and he would drive me to the court they take me up the back entrance and I would sit there and he would sit there and he'd say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He's not going to do nothing to you. We have police officers sitting in the front row. If he tries to get up, we will stop him before he can even reach you. Don't worry. I was just so afraid. I'd go in and I would tremble. But this last time when I went to Virginia, I told myself, you're not afraid. You're not afraid of him anymore. You're a woman. You're going to look at him and you're going to speak up and you're going to make sure that he's you know, tried for this because these people didn't deserve it either, you know, and, and I wanted to go see him executed, but I'm a single parent. I didn't have the money to get out there, you know, and I wanted to go so bad and I was so upset that I couldn't, but I had a friend that was actually living out there because her husband was in the military also. So she actually went to where he was at and she just stood on the outside. She goes, I was here for you. She goes, I know you couldn't make it, but I was here for you. Uh, I couldn't be there, but how old were you when you testified against Alfredo Prieto in California? I had just turned 18. And then how old were you when you testified against him in Virginia? What was it, 2010 that he was, ex when was he executed? I think the trial was 2007, April 2007. And then the retrial was in 2008. 2008. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I was there the last time. Veronica was no longer with us. She had already passed away. Hmm. Yeah, Rachel's mother had already passed away, so... She wasn't there to see it or nothing, but I met Matt. Is it Matt, Rachel's brother? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never met Dee Dee in person. Ooh. No, I did not meet Dee Dee. Okay. Um, I spoke to her on the phone. You must have met Velda. No, I don't remember meeting Velda. I met Crystal because we went to the Cheesecake Factory to eat after. Mm. I met Crystal and I met Matt. Mm. Yeah, they were there. Okay, if it was in 2008... Gosh, I, I don't I don't like to keep track of my age. I was born in 73. So what how old would I have been? I was um 35? Probably around there, yeah. So 17 years later. Yes. Going to the other coast of the United States. When I looked at him, I don't think he knew who I was because I was married, my last name had changed. I looked totally different from what I did then. I remember when I sat there and I looked at him and I kept staring at him like, come on, you remember me. Now look at me. I'm not afraid of you no more. Look at me. I'm going to make sure that everything I do here today is to get you wiped off the face of the earth. He kept looking at me and he was like puzzled. He kept looking and I could see the expression on his face. And for once, I actually believed that that expression was true. He was like, who are you? Like, who is this? You know, he wasn't sure of who I was. And when they said who I was, he just kept looking. And I think honestly, until I walked out of there, he wasn't sure who I was. He kept looking and looking at me as I walked out and I was just so afraid he was going to jump up and grab me or something. But they were so wonderful out there in Virginia. They were so great. Uh, I knew that I was protected. Will you tell Jennifer about that day that you saw the detectives walking up your driveway when you lived with your mom? Yeah, they were walking up the driveway and I was like, um, I seen a bunch of men. There was white men 
and Hispanic men and they have their guns and their badges. And it's all like, what are they doing here? You know, I was so afraid, you know, I couldn't even think of what they would be doing here. And they came to the gate and they asked for me by name. I was like, oh my gosh, what could be going on? And so I walked out and they explained to me what had happened. The reason they were there from Virginia, the Ontario police were a couple of them I was familiar with from the trial. And they explained what they were doing here. And they proceeded to tell me that he had killed prior to the incident that happened with us. He was in Virginia and then above Virginia, like, was it by New York where he killed his best friend or whoever his friend was? He set on fire. What was that? Yeah, I think he also died in Virginia, but I don't know what part of Virginia. Manuel Sermano was his name, that guy. Yes. Yeah. They had said that we needed to go back to Virginia. There was going to be a date that they would let us know when we had to go back to Virginia, me and my mom, to testify. And I told them, she's not going to testify. She never stayed the same after this. I kept telling the Ontario officers, you guys know she didn't stay the same. Why are you going to make her go back and testify? And I said, I'm not going back. I'm done with it. I told him I would go back as long as my mom didn't have to go through it. I would go back. I would testify. I would be there as long as they needed me, but they could not take her back. They had to promise me they weren't going to take her back. So they said, okay. Didn't they also tell you? I mean, he would have me arrested if I didn't go on my own free will. Because at first I kept saying, I'm not going, I'm not going. He says, well, we'll have to get a warrant, come back, and we'll have to take you. And you're going to have to actually be handcuffed. We're going to have to take you back. You know, you're not going to want to go, but you're going to go back either way. We're taking you back. And I said, okay, 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 okay. I will go on my own free will. I said, it's not that I don't want to help. I just don't want to have to relive it again. I said, you don't understand what it does to a person. When women are raped, they don't go forward because they're being victimized again once they have to go to trial. They make it seem like you asked for it. I said, do you guys know what it's like to have to go through all of this? I had to go through watching all this happen then finding my best friend dead at a tree, trying to drag her body away, knowing that I couldn't carry her because she was gone already. And even though I tried my hardest to tell myself that she was still alive, I knew she was gone. I blocked out a lot in my mind and I didn't, I didn't see this. I didn't actually, I never had seen this until the day I was in Virginia. The day that that happened, I seen her slumped up against the tree. She was bleeding a little bit. Blood was on her face and so forth. And on her shirt, she had drips of blood. But she wasn't like that. She was actually completely naked with just her socks on. And she had been shot in the top of the head. I guess it blew out the back of her head. But I never seen that. But when I was in Virginia, they showed me a picture of that when I was on the stand. If I remembered her being like that, and I didn't. I didn't remember her naked, you know, completely naked with just her socks on. And I told myself that day that she was alive. I wouldn't leave her until my mom said, Lisa, we got to get help. Because I actually went to my mom. My mom was out. I thought my mom was dead also. She had been stabbed a lot more times than me. Had we not gone for help, it was hard. It was really hard. I lost my shoes. We were in a field. I stepped on glass. It's just, I'm jumping from one thing to another, I know, and it's... You're doing great. It all started in Ontario when I was in my car, my first car my grandmother had got me. Me and my mom used to get out of work at 1130 at night, but my mom was going to my cousin's girlfriend's house. And I bumped into my mother at the signals about three blocks away from my house. I pulled up alongside her and said, where are you going? And she said, to Connie's house. She goes, where are you guys going? It's already time for you to go home. I said, not if I'm with you. I don't have to go home. <laughs> so I followed her and we were going to just go to my cousin. They were celebrating a birthday and my mom pulled in the driveway and I pulled up in front to park. But it happened so quick. I don't remember what happened. I seen somebody at my mom's window, a guy, but he had his back towards me. And then I seen my mom's foot went off the brake. She must have put it in park. So I figured she was going to get off. Maybe it's somebody talking to her that was in the house. I didn't even see where they came from. But before you knew what I went to turn to open my door, I was going to get off. And I was told to turn my head and not look at him. And then I felt a gun on the side of my head. I was driving. Yvette was sitting passenger. So I turned my head when I looked at Yvette. There was a guy at her window. And all I could see was like the top part of him. And he told her to turn and not look. So me and Yvette are looking at each other face to face. And they're on the outside of the windows. They had made us get off, get in the back seat. And three of them were in the front. Me, my mom, and Yvette were in the back, and they made us put our heads between our legs. 
I kept looking up, even though I was told not to look up or they were going to blow my head off. I kept looking up because I was afraid. I was like, what, what am I going to do if something happens? I'm never going to remember who they are. I need to remember this face. So I kept looking up and through my rear view mirror, all I could see was Alfredo Prieto's eyes. He has these really odd shaped eyes and he has this evil look in him. It was so scary. I remember the guy sitting in the middle and I remember this because when I would look up, I could see the back of their heads. They all look different, of course, but they had heavy accents, like really heavy accents. But one of them did not have an accent and his English was perfect. And he wanted them to let us off the car and they would not let us off the car. So he said they weren't going to let us off the car. He wanted off the car because he didn't want no part of it. He said, I don't want no part of this. This is not what we came out to do. We came out to rob them at this house, do what we had to do, but never anything else. Let them go. They wouldn't. So he got off the car. They let him off the car. And I can tell you exactly where it was at. It was the first stop sign as we left my cousin's girlfriend's house, which was D in campus. And they proceeded to move on. And I was counting the stop signs. Then after we counted the stop signs, I felt like a bumpy road. And then I could hear like loud music. I could hear people talking and laughing. I guess they had gone to like where there was a gathering and they asked for somebody by name. That person came out. He was apparently drunk. He was like laughing and everything was fun. Oh yeah, he was ready to go have fun. He joined them. So there was three guys again. They dropped one off. There was two in the car, but they picked up the third one. That's when they stopped. My car was on empty. They stopped to put gas. There was people at the gas station because I could hear people at the gas station. It was like one o'clock in the morning, maybe by then. And I'm thinking, okay, well, somebody's going to report this. There's three girls in the back with their heads down, you know? Nobody ever reported anything. I would have thought the people at my cousin's girlfriend's house would have reported something. They didn't report nothing either. I couldn't believe that they just let it happen like that. They were so afraid. Did you talk to them later? Did you, did they see what was happening? Yeah, well, they thought when the lights hit the house, what Alfredo Prieto and his friends thought that they were the police coming. They panicked. That's why they like kind of came to the window. When they came out the front door, that's when everybody in the house ran out the back door and took off running because they had them all at gunpoint on their knees. Everyone in the house? Well, there was not very many people in the house. There were maybe like five people, but they, they ran. And one of them that ran was my cousin. I couldn't believe my cousin was there with his girlfriend and he ran and nobody ever reported anything. Not even my own family reported it. And that was sad. I was like, mom, they're gonna find us. They're gonna find us. They're gonna report it. My car will be found. They'll stop us before anything happens. But no, it seemed like it dragged on forever and forever and forever. So then you're at the gas station. After the gas station, we went out and then I felt the wind. So we were on the freeway. They exited at some point and wherever they went, it was like a long, it was a distance. It was very quiet. I couldn't hear no cars or nothing. So I knew we were somewhere like in the boondocks, probably. They get off and we're on a bumpy road again. And then my car got stuck. He went over a high curb and the bottom of my car got stuck. They had to get off two of them and they were trying to push it. I could feel the bottom of my car like ripping. They were tearing off my muffler and everything. So then when I opened my eyes, they made us get off. Directly behind Alfredo Prieto was myself. I was sitting. He was driving. So when they made us get off the car, Alfredo Prieto originally told me, you're going to come here with me. And I was freaked out. I was like, no, 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 no. At one point, they pulled us off and he pushed me and he grabbed Yvette by her shirt and Yvette was screaming and crying. And she was like, mom, mom, calling. Because she's called my mom, mom. She said, mom, mom, help me, please. My mom was so devastated that she couldn't help her. You know, there was nothing she could do. They had us at, the knives were very large and huge. I didn't know there was one, but I thought we were all going to get shot. When I heard Yvette screaming, it must have been because she was being raped. And she kept saying, he's hurting me. He's hurting me, mom. Get him off of me. And my mom couldn't do nothing. They had us all separated. We were all in different areas of a field. And all I can remember was looking up and seeing Helter Skelter written on a piece of one wall that was standing on a building. And then industrial buildings, there was like a bunch of warehouses like all around us. But it was quiet. It was quiet. It was a holiday. There was no one in the warehouses. I would have thought that there would have been people in the warehouses. I thought somebody would have heard something, but no, 
There was no cars even going by, nothing. We were like literally the only car out there. And so I was raped and my mother was raped. But as I was being raped, he was biting me out of frustration. He was biting me and he kept kicking me in my stomach and kicking me. When I was at the hospital, I had bruises all over my whole body from being kicked. And I had bite marks, teeth marks all over my body, you know, cuts and stuff on my arms and that and stab wounds in my back. But I used to wear these gold rings that my grandmother and my mom had bought me. And one ring was a pretty, it was a Virgin Mary and it was like kind of long, you know, in length. When he went to stab me in my neck, I pulled my hand up and I screamed and the blade broke on my, um, my ring. He kicked me one last time. I said, just take it, suck it up and stop breathing. Hold your breath because if you don't pretend you're dead, they're going to come shoot you and you're going to die. So I held my breath and I was eating like dirt and twigs and everything in my mouth. I had dirt in my eyes, but I just stayed still. I did not move. I did not move. And I can remember somebody saying, did you do it? And he said, yeah, I did it. I did it. And then my mom, she was quiet. I didn't hear nothing from my mom, but like, uh, (gasps) that was it. And I was like, she's gone too, you know, but I got, somebody has to survive this. I said, because I have to be able to make sure that they're put away or they're going to keep walking the streets and they're going to keep hurting people. Finally, I heard my car take off and it was like really loud. They must have busted my muffler. They took off. I remember I was looking around and it was so dark. I couldn't see anything. I finally found my mom. I went to her and I was shaking her, shaking her. My mom was pale, pretty white, like a ghost. She had been stabbed so many times in her back that she, um, felt like she couldn't walk. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't walk. She had lost a lot of blood, but I said, I couldn't leave without her. I was dragging her practically. And my mom tried her hardest and she got up and we managed to get to Yvette. Like I said, I thought Yvette was hurt, but I didn't think she was dead. And I didn't want to leave her. I wanted to take her to my mom kept saying, you have to leave her. We have to leave her. We have to go get help and come back. If there's any chance of her being okay, we have to get her help. So we continued to go. I lost my shoes. I had on sandals. I had lost them. We had to go through a field with, I mean, it was just, just trash out there. You know, I remember going down a ditch on my butt and I had to crawl up on my knees and I had to have my mom, I was pulling her. I jumped a big, huge fence into the Kmart distribution warehouse. I had like a sweater above my shirt. It got caught on the fence and it ripped. I landed down on my back and I remember the sprinklers were on. And I said, okay, we're going to get help. Let's go. And my mom was barely moving, barely moving, but I wouldn't leave without her. So we kept going and going. Finally, we got to where the warehouse was. They had a bunch of fans, like big, huge fans. And I kept looking through there, see if I seen anybody inside there. There was no one in there. Finally, I seen a security officer coming around in his little security car. He seen us and he stopped and He wouldn't let us in his office because he said, no, 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 don't touch nothing on your body. Don't lay down. Don't you destroy evidence. Stay there. I'm calling police. I said, okay. So we did. And I was afraid. I think I was already hallucinating. I kept hearing them coming back. I kept seeing them. I kept seeing my car and I was panicking. The first officer that got there for us was Officer Eric Hernandez. He was barely new to the force. He was a young Hispanic cop. I don't know if he had ever seen anything like that, but it sure didn't look like he did. He said, I'm going to have to take you back to the scene. He goes, you need to help me so I can find where she's at. And I was afraid. I said, no, 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 no. They're going to come back and they're going to kill all of us. Even you, I was thinking. And he says, no, you got to go back with me. That was the last time I seen my mom. They took her and I didn't know where she went. They wouldn't tell me what hospital she was at. They didn't want us to be around each other because they wanted to question us. And they didn't want us to talk to each other about what had happened, I guess. That's what they told me. Because I kept asking, where's my mom and where's Yvette? After I took the officer back to where she was at, he got off and he left me in the back of the police car. I was locked back there. I didn't realize that. I wasn't handcuffed or nothing, but the doors were closed. I couldn't get out. I kept yelling and screaming, like, come on, let me out. They're going to come back and they're going to kill me. Don't don't leave me here. Because he could only go so far in where he had to stop where I told you my car got stuck. He couldn't go past that barrier thing. So he stopped there and then he continued to walk in to go find Yvette. When he came back, he was radioing something and I was sitting in the back seat and I said, is she alive? And he just says, we're going to get you to the hospital. That's all he told me. We're going to get you to the hospital right now. And I 
I kept saying, well, is she alive? Is she alive? And I don't recall him ever answering if she was alive or not. I didn't find out she was dead until the day that I was being discharged from the hospital. My grandfather and grandmother were picking me up and her mother was there in them. Um, that's when I found out she was dead. Her mother wasn't nice. She, she hated me for a long time. Oh. She did. Her mother didn't like me for a long time. She blamed me. She said it was my fault that her daughter was gone. Oh. Had her daughter not been with me, none of that would have happened. Why did God have to take her daughter? Why can't he have took me too? Or why can't he have left her daughter and taken me? And so forth. And I was like so devastated. My grandmother told her, you know what, lady, you are crazy. You don't know what you're saying. But I hope when you find out the real facts that you regret what you're telling my granddaughter right now because you don't know what she's going through. It took her a long time before she was able to sit through all of the trial and listen. And then she apologized. I couldn't really find myself to talk to her, but I did. I listened to her and I understand, I guess now as a parent, where she was coming from, she was hurt. She was just so hurt and so lost without her. And she didn't know what had happened. As a parent, I would have done the same, probably maybe I would have wished my daughter was gone. She was grieving. She was yeah, grieving. It was hard for yeah. Her. And she didn't know where to put her anger. Yeah. Lisa, one of the things that I'm, first of all, you're so generous with sharing this with us. Thank you. And one of the things that I'm so taken by is how clear headed you were through the entire experience about where you were going, what you needed to do. Very clear. I'm getting out of this and I'm getting out of this to put these people away. That is, I've never heard of anything like that. That is just remarkable strength and vision. I knew I had to do something. Yeah. And then it is interesting that there's this moment where you realize we're saved. Someone, ha we've now found a person. And that's when you start to allow yourself to kind of relax a little bit. And then the fear starts to flood in, you know, like you, mm -hmm. you, start, you said, oh, and then I started to hallucinate. But none of that happened while you were the one who had to be in charge and pay attention and listen and see what you could, you know, how you could get out of this. It is, it is completely remarkable. And I know that there are other moments throughout everything that happens where you had to gather that strength that you have. I know that you have told me that you've experienced fear throughout the years and that life has never been the same and that you fear for your, your grandchildren and your daughters, but that strength lives on in you. And you had to muster it again for these trials. And I do want to ask Jen one question before we kind of look at the trials. Sure. Jen, when she talked about that this officer took her back there to go find a vet and left her in the backseat of the car with the doors locked, does that sound like proper procedure? I'm just wondering, I mean, the way she described how scared she was and... I think he was afraid also. The expression on his face was like, to me, he was, he was young. I've seen him like maybe years, several years later, he's gray like me. So he was young then and he didn't get me off the car. He left me in the back seat, And like I said, he could only pull up to that barrier because if he would have tried to cross the barrier, he would have messed up the bottom of his car, you know? So he left me right there. But like I said, I was not handcuffed. He just left me in the car and he proceeded to go find her. I said, she's straight ahead and she's at that tree. I said, the tree right there, you'll see her. She's sitting down. She's like slumped up against the tree. And wasn't Rachel also slumped up against a tree or am I wrong? After this happened, I didn't really look into anything that happened to Rachel and Warren. I was just glad it was over with. I was just glad I was able to help everybody and, and so forth. Sometimes the details don't matter when yeah. the end game, when you're able to accomplish yeah. the goal, right? Yeah. Andrea, I can answer all that later when we don't have Lisa's time. I can, okay. We can kind okay. of ask ourselves questions as we think through this interview. Got it, got it, got it. I want to share this with you guys. A week before this happened, the movie Ghost came out with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. We went to go see that with Yvonne, which was Yvette's older sister and her boyfriend. And I remember it was Jose, the boyfriend, Yvonne next to him, Yvette, and then myself were in the movie theater and we're watching the movie. And you know when they shoot him and his spirit leaves his body and he's running? Yvette looked at me and she hit me with her album. She says, hey. And I said, what, Yvette? I said, watch the movie. And she goes, I wonder what it feels like when you die. Does your spirit really leave your body like that? I wonder what it would feel like. She goes, that's weird. Look at how he's running. She goes, he's running. I said, oh my God. I said, there you go with your imagination again. I said, stop Yvette. I said, no one's going to die. She goes, I just wonder what it would feel like. Then a week later, she dies. 
If you or someone you know is connected either personally or as the result of violent crime to Alfredo Prieto, a convicted rapist and killer who lived in and around San Bernardino, California, Arlington, Virginia, and Jamaica, Queens, New York between the years of 1984 and 1990, we'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at theheromakerpodcast.com. It was weird. And I remember she had told me when we were in the back seat of the car, the windows were down. I'm telling you, we could hear, just hear wind that. She says, hey. And I said, what? She goes, I love you. I said, I love you too, Yvette. She goes, I want you to know that if one of us doesn't make it out of here alive, I want you to know that I love you. And I said, we're going to make it out of here alive. What's wrong with you? You're crazy. We're all going to be okay. And she kept saying, just in case. And I could see it in her face. I looked at her and there was just a different look on her face. Like she just knew, she just knew it was her time to go. Mm. It was weird. She was only going to be 16 years old. She was my best friend. She was two years younger than me. But Lisa, can I ask you a question? I'm sure I'm going to be processing this for a long time. The, the density of everything you've just said and the intensity of everything you've just said. I would love for you guys to read the transcripts and that so you'll get more because I'm jumping from theme to theme here. It's not like I'm trying to remember as I'm going, but. Oh, you don't have to. We're not asking you to remember everything and tell us every terrible detail. Some of the things that I think about in really big cases like this are what are the lessons that we can learn for the future? But let me, before I ask you that question, let me ask you this one. If there were heroes in the midst of this tragedy, who were they for you? My heroes were um, Mary Fuller and Eric Hoppe. Those are the two that did it for me. And Rachel's mom, Veronica, she was my hero because she was just a strong lady. She survived all this, you know, all these years, not knowing who it was that actually did that to her daughter. You know, I'm thankful for the system now that they were able to lean into it because who knows, he would have probably never been tried there in Virginia. And I knew he was going to sit here in California on death row forever and ever and ever. And it was never going to happen. California doesn't do that. They don't execute. I was so amazed when he was executed that quick. Can you tell me a little more about that, what you just said? Like, knowing that he was on now on death row in Virginia as opposed to California, and then him being executed. Can you speak a little bit more about what that meant to you? To me, it was like a, a sigh of relief because I was able to sleep better at night knowing that Even though he was convicted and he was in prison, I was still fearful at night. I was still afraid because that day that that happened, my registration was in my car. My license was in my car. So all that went with him when they did that to us. They found all that evidence. They found my car keys. They found my registration. They found articles that they were cutting out of the newspaper of what happened to us all in their property. When they went to their house to arrest them, they knew who they were. I think the police officers knew who they were. Before I even described them, I couldn't tell you their names. I couldn't say any of that because I could only describe what they look like. It's funny how they gave me a photo lineup of six photos. And in each one they showed me were each three men. I was like, how do they know to put those pictures in there? I think they knew who they were already. But yeah, when he was executed, it was a sigh of relief for myself just knowing he was no longer here. I just don't think a person that can do that to people deserves to stay alive. They don't. I, I'm sorry. I'm just, I don't. I think that if they're going to take a life, they need their life taken also. I don't think it was fair. It was, just wasn't fair that they killed Rachel. They killed Warren. They killed Tina. They killed Yvette. And then I believe they said there was these two other ones in Riverside County. Stacy and Tony. And then the Farleys. Was it Farley? The Farleys. Yeah. The older couple that was behind, it was an old Alpha Beta. Yeah. I remember reading that. Anyways, my heroes are a lot of people. Who's Mary? Say something more about who was Mary. Mary Fuller. Mary Fuller. Yeah. Yes. She was the DA. My mom's sister was murdered in 1987. And she was the DA that prosecuted the person that killed my aunt in 1987. And then she was actually the judge on Prieto's case. She became a judge. And she was the judge on his case. And she is just so wonderful, Mary. She is the best. I found a lot of people along the way were just so wonderful. They were so good to us. Did you ever have any victim advocates along the way? No, not in California. When I got to Virginia, we had Sally Fias. She was very good. I talked to her a lot on the phone. 
There was one officer I remember. He was really good. He's the one who connected us with Sally Fayez. But here in California, no, they didn't do much to help us. They didn't. The victims out of it didn't do much to help us. Yvette's mother didn't even have the money for her funeral. Yvonne, which was Yvette's oldest sister, her best friend's mother actually gave up one of her children's spots. You know, she had bought all the plots in advance. She gave up one of the plots for Yvette because they didn't have money to bury her. The victims of crime unit, at one point in time, maybe they did. I never asked the mother, kept up with it. I just kind of, it was done and over with. I know that she had to get a lot of stuff was given to her for Yvette's funeral. A lot of people like gathered, friends and family gathered to donate money to get her funeral covered. We've come a long way in the world of victim advocacy. I can definitely say that. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you, you knew the three women who were the victims, yourself, your mom, and your best friend. You, these are people you know better than anyone in the world. When you think about the three of you, did you always have a survivor's instinct? Were you always straight badass? Yes. And were they a different mindset? Yes. I really do believe there is something to a survivor's mindset. Yes. Tell me a little more about maybe some of your characteristics when you were younger that helped you in this moment. I grew up in a family where a lot of the males are drug addicts. They've been in prison, you know, a lot of my cousins and my uncles and so forth. And just seeing the way they grew up and and stuff that's happened to them, my mom's sister being murdered. She was actually murdered in her home and her roommate and the roommate's boyfriend were also killed. I'm just a strong person. I believe inside I'm a strong person. I just, I'm a fighter. I guess growing up with a single mother after my mom and dad divorced when I was 10 years old, I just had my mom and my mom was a strong person. I don't understand how this happened. I mean, I know how this happened to us, but it just made her, she's not the same. I wish you could talk to my mom. She's not the same. People always ask me, God, I haven't seen your mom in years. Where's she at nowadays? But she comes home and she won't leave the house. She does online billing. Now she's learned how to do the grocery shopping through Walmart. To get them delivered? Yeah. 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 You know, everybody's experience of victimization is different, and I've seen it throughout my career. There is no right or wrong way to grieve or to recover, but it sounds like this survivor mindset, this toughness that you developed at a young age, not only got you through the incident, but has helped you thrive as an adult. Victimization can do terrible, lifelong things to people, and a lot of people wind up substance abuse disorder, mental health disorders in a really bad place. And it sounds like you have persevered and made a pretty decent life for yourself. I have. There's times, I'm not going to lie, where I felt I was going to slip out of this life that I live into and I was going to like lose it. I felt like I would end up in a mental hospital at times, but I kept telling myself, I can't do that. I can beat this. I can beat it. It took me a long time. Like I said, finally, once I knew he was out of California and Virginia, he's the one I feared the most because he was evil. He was very evil. And I was so afraid of him, but I'm okay with it. I can deal with life now because my main goal now is to protect my kids. They're not kids no more. They're all young women, but I worry for all of my girls. Yeah. And you can only imagine your mother's pain. You can only imagine knowing now what you know about your daughters. She told me one time, I feel guilt. She goes, I feel guilt for not being able to protect you guys. She says, I feel horrible. You don't know what it did to me inside. She goes, it tore me up. My mom doesn't like to speak about it too much. I asked her, I said, mom, I said, why is it that you're so afraid to go out into the world? She goes, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to protect you again. I didn't do it the first time. I don't think I could do it a second time. If it wasn't for you to be the strong one that was able to get through all this, she goes, I wouldn't have been able to get through the trial without you. Well, you're an amazing woman and you are brave as hell to spend so much time talking to us. I mean, particularly me, a perfect stranger. I don't mind. It's something that happened and if it can help somebody else, I didn't listen to every podcast, but I listened to Valdez and to when Dee Dee was on. And um, yeah, they're really strong women because I know I took a lot out of them too, you know, to have all those years without knowing what happened. Yeah. Really, who was the person that did that? At some point, you're going to hear Eric Copley. Oh, okay. And Bob Murphy. You should tune in. Right. I haven't talked to Eric Copley in years. He became our chief of police, I believe, for Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one time I had to go in and get a ticket written off that I had got. And when I did, I seen his big picture on the wall and I said, oh, wow, he's there. Yeah. Eric Copley is a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man. 
God, if it wasn't for him, I would. He's the one. Eric Hoffley is the one who actually got me to go. I mean, I felt so Jean, even Jean, uh, what was her last name? She was a female officer. She was one of the detectives originally on it. And uh, she passed away already. But she was an officer, um, Jean. I can't remember her last name. She was so good. The officer that was the main investigator on Yvette's case, he retired and moved out of state. I remember he used to always tell me, I was married to a Hispanic woman. He would like start to talk and then he would say, I know these words in Spanish. And he was so nice. I can't remember his name. There were so many nice people. I looked at officers different now from when I did when I was younger. Younger, I was always worried, I'm going to get a ticket. I'm going to get pulled over. And, you know, I seen the way officers were when they would arrest my cousins and stuff. But now I have a different outlook on them. I started having a different outlook on officers since that happened to us. And I respect them so much now. And I'm so grateful for them because I know that they're there to help us. My girls know nothing about the street life. My girls were cheerleaders in high school. They moved on to be better women than I was at a young age. I could tell you if it was me, if I had to be in the streets, I would be able to survive because I'm more familiar with the environment that's going on out there because I grew up around it. My kids, once I had kids, I took them out of this lifestyle. I didn't want them to see the way I grew up. You're just as much a badass as a mom as you were as a young woman and as you are as a grown woman. Yeah. And really, at the end of the day, that's the most important job you ever had, right? Being a mom, being a grandma. I'm very, very proud of my girls and my grandchildren. Well, if I can ever help in any way, Andrea has my contact info and you can call me. Uh, she has my cell. You can email me. I'd be happy to help if there's any way I can help or if you need something you in Vermont. Amazing. You guys are friends of Rachel's, right? Yes. I was on the soccer team with Rachel and I was friends, not terribly good friends with Warren, but friends with Warren. But Rachel, I was close friends with. Yeah. And I was also a student athlete at the same time. And we were all in the same friend group and I knew them both. And this was a big event for us. Certainly, I'm not trying to compare our experience to yours in any way, shape or form. But yeah, we're incredibly honored that you would share your story with us and yourself. It goes way beyond this. Like I said, I would like for you guys to read the transcripts. It would give you more of what went on, actually. Okay. Actually, I'm just going to say real quick, Jennifer has to jump off. I can stay on for another few minutes, and I want to hear what you want us to do. Okay. Lisa, God bless you. Thank you for taking the time. Nice meeting you, Jennifer. Thank you. The Hero Maker Podcast would like to thank our supporter, Restaurant Olivia, located in Denver, Colorado's Wash Park neighborhood. The hospitality family at Restaurant Olivia believes that we are all here to take care of each other, one handmade pasta dish at a time. Our food is made with care and intention with locally sourced ingredients whenever possible. Our beverage program features expertly crafted, playful cocktails and an Italian-focused international wine list. Restaurant Olivia invites you to start small and let the caring spread. Visit oliviadenver.com to make your reservation or place your to-go order today. The Williamson County Cultural Arts Commission of Franklin, Tennessee wishes to thank our men and women in blue who help us deliver safe and fun family and community cultural events year-round including one of the only authentic bluegrass festivals in the country. Bluegrass Along the Harpeth takes place every July and at the Williamson County Fair in August and at the annual Tennessee International Independent Film Festival. Check out our full calendar of events at wccac-tn.org. So we will read the transcripts. And what else would you like us to do? I just want you to read them so you can know more or less what went on. But tell me more about this. So you've already interviewed Eric Copley? Yeah. How did you go about finding all them? You went through the, the police reports or the transcripts or what? News articles to find out who was who? You know, they don't just put everything on the internet anymore because there are these companies that are trying to make money on court stuff. Yeah. But I was able to get Eric's name at a certain point and I literally called and left him a message. I was like, I'm calling for Eric Hopley and this is why. And we ended up talking. Yeah, there was just so many good people like they did everything they could to protect us. When we'd go up the elevator, there was like four of them around us. 
They made sure that the halls were clear before they brought us down. Because I was afraid. I thought somebody would be waiting for me just to kill me, finish me off once and for all. You know, I was just so afraid. I didn't even come home after this happened to us. I didn't even bother coming home to get my belongings. From there, we went straight to my mom's sister's house in Pomona. And to stop and think about it, we were living in Pomona. And I thought I was safe when they actually claimed a gang from Pomona. And that wasn't too far from my aunt's house. And they weren't even arrested yet. And I thought I was safe. You know, later on to find out after all this had happened, I read an article where they arrested each and every one of them. One of them lived a minute away from where we lived. He lived right up the street from where we lived. Alfredo Prieto lived on B Street, which was like maybe four minutes away. I passed that spot where we picked up that third guy every day going to work. I passed by it, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Can I tell you something? Um, I'm jumping from end to end. I'm just like, I don't even know where to go with this, but this is funny. And this is a true fact. My daughter is 24 now. When she was like about four years old, we were here at my mom's, my husband, myself, and my daughter. And we were leaving down the driveway. My husband forgot something. My mom has a long driveway. He had to walk back up the driveway. We were standing in the front and we were going to Disneyland that day. We we're taking her to Disneyland. A balloon flew above and it landed in the tree in the front of my mom's house. And it was a Disney balloon. It was so weird. It was a Disney balloon. And my daughter says, mama, mama, your friend said, hi. And I said, hi, what friend? She says, your friend said, hi, mama. She says, Coco here, Coco here on her head. It hurt. And I was thinking, what is she talking about? I kind of dawned on me and she said, mama, your friend says, hi, she has Coco here. It hurts her, Coco hurts. And I was thinking, you've got shot in the head. She's telling me that somebody's saying hi to me. So that day before we went to Disneyland, we went to the cemetery. I asked my husband to take me to the cemetery. We stopped and I never knew where she was at as far as where they laid her down to rest because I didn't attend her services. But when we went in the main gates, I asked for a map of where she was at and I still couldn't find her. And we took her flowers and my daughter was running up and down the hills at Forest Lawn, up and down the hills. And she says, mama, mama, here, mama, mama, here. And I got close and I looked down and it was Yvette's headstone. <gasps> she knew exactly where she was at. It was really, really weird. Well, I know that children are so much more open to those kinds of things. The more we talk about the real world and focusing more on the things we can see and touch that we lose some of those abilities. So it's... I think Yvette came that day. I believe it. It sounds like it. She showed herself like maybe she knew like, I'm not going to tell my four-year-old about stuff like that, you know? She kept calling it a cocoa because that's what we call a cut, a cocoa, your cocoa on your finger. Yeah. And she said she had a cocoa on her head and she said, hi. And she would tell me and I would be like, wow. There was a couple of times I heard her voice here in my house. I heard her say, mom, mom, because she's called my mom, 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 mom. It's weird. But as much as I wish I would dream her or see her in my dreams, I don't. I don't. I, I did maybe one time after she died, but I've never seen her again. Her mom passed on. I don't know where they buried her mom, I think in Texas. Yvette's all there. I think about her and I think she's at Forest Lawn and she's all alone. They buried her there because they didn't have the money and it was given to them, but nobody ever goes to see her. I haven't gone there in years. It's been a lot, a lot of years, but the last time I was there, her cup was so deep down. It was so filled with dirt and the grass. Nobody goes to see her. Nobody, not even her sisters. Maybe you would join me? There one day? Yes. Yes. Nobody goes to visit Yvette. Nobody takes her flowers, nothing. And she's all alone. I think about that a lot, but I don't go out there because it just, it's hard for me to go out there. It's hard for me to go out there and leave and just know that I'm walking away, but she's not. But yeah, I'm just so glad you're doing this. I'm sorry I'm jumping from one thing to another. I was just so nervous to do it. I told myself I was going to do it. And I said, oh gosh, I can't do it. My younger brother, he lives with my mom. He kept saying, you got to do it. You got to do it. It's so, it's so good. You have to, you, you know, you got to let other people hear it so that they can learn from it. And maybe it'll help somebody else along the way. And my daughters kept saying, mom, just do it, do it, do it. How do you feel? How do you feel talking to us today? I feel okay. I, I don't have a problem with talking to you guys. I just, well, we're going to be complete for today because I actually have to go get my son and maybe you and I can go visit the gravesite. Yes. You're in California, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, she's at Forest Lawn in West Covina. Yeah, and I'll text you again within the next week. Okay. And we'll we'll see if we can find a time to do that. And also, you can change your mind. Okay. Have you seen a picture of Yvette before? I have. You have? Yeah. Where'd you get the picture from, if you don't mind me asking? Stephanie sent me a bunch of them at one point. She does have a lot of pictures of Yvette? She does. I don't have very many. I have like maybe three, I think. Yeah, I'll share everything I have with you. Yeah, I have three. There's one of me and Yvette and a friend of ours. She was Yvette's next door neighbor. There's one that we took together at a studio. The three of us, yeah. I remember I had dyed Yvette's hair. She wanted it like blondish color and I did it. And I I remember she was so mad when she left. She goes, you did that on purpose. You made me look like a skunk. So she's like, I look like a skunk and you did it on purpose. Just for that, we're going to go take pictures. (laughs) And she took the pictures like that. (laughs) She was funny. She was a funny girl. She was very, very funny. That's awesome. I'm here to talk to you. Like I said, you can call me. I won't answer most of the time because I screen my calls. But if you text me, I read every text. There's not a doubt. I look at all my text messages and I read everyone. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks to sound mixer and podcast producer, Michael Doherty, sound designer, Andy Bill of Submachine Audio, and graphic designer, Junglin Bay. Thanks also to me, hero maker, director, and producer, Andrea Schreeman. Please subscribe to the show where you listen to podcasts and take a moment to rate us. It really helps the podcast grow. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Hero Maker Pod. Want to collaborate or suggest a guest? Please email us at media at theheromakerpodcast.com. The Hero Maker Podcast is a production of Prudent Pictures. Thank you so much for listening.